Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. You are listening to the podcast For the Love of Reading, sponsored by Highlights for Children. I'm Christine French Cully, your podcast host and editor in chief of Highlights. With us today is Dr. Depesh Nafsaria. Dr. Nafsaria is a primary care pediatrician in the great state of Wisconsin, where he is also an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. I think it's so interesting that he is a pediatrician with a graduate degree in children's librarianship, and he is a very vocal advocate of early literacy. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Nafsaria. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure to be here. I'd like to begin, if you would, by hearing more about your personal story. Can you talk a little bit about how you as a physician came to become so deeply interested in early literacy? So I became interested in early literacy uh, when I was an undergraduate at Boston University. I worked for a program that, uh, a project, a research project that looked at uh, parent-child interactions Down the hall from that project where I was analyzing countless hours of videotape, there was a program that I heard about in the primary care clinic there called Reach Out and Read. This was this wonderful idea that children um, should be getting books at regular checkups and that parents should have a opportunity and advice and support in working together with their children uh, through daily reading. Now, I thought this is the greatest thing. Now, I was an undergraduate. I really didn't know that much about all this, Uh, but it sounded like a neat idea. That was ultimately what led me to um, be exposed to this program when I was a physician assistant in Washington, DC, to set up a Reach Out and Read program at the clinic I worked at in Illinois later on. And then ultimately, um, when I was in medical school in Illinois, to choose to go to library school and learn more about children's books. And that's how I basically fell down that rabbit hole. That's a wonderful rabbit hole to fall into. We here at Highlights are big fans of Reach Out and Read. We love their commitment to getting books into hands of children and helping parents understand the importance of that work. Yes, thank you. And, you know, really Reach Out and Read is now in almost 6,000 clinics throughout the country um, and many right here in Wisconsin that I've, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with primary care uh, clinicians of all types in incorporating it into their regular practice. And how exactly do you incorporate it into your regular practice? What do you say to parents about reading to children? So the approach is that we have the clinician, the, the, the doctor, the nurse practitioner, the, the physician assistant, they walk into the child's regular checkup, or they walk into the room with a book in their hand. This book is age appropriate, developmentally appropriate, culturally, language appropriate, all those things. And we give the book directly to the child. This is really important for us to do because if the book's given at another time by someone else, we lose a valuable opportunity to see what is the child doing with the book? What's their response to it? And also what's the parent's response, right? Is this something of joy, glee? Does that child take the book and turn to their parent and hold it out to them showing, I know what this thing is and I want you to look at it with me. Um, It tells you about what their home exposure is like and all of those things. So when we walk in, hand that book to the child and watch, we can do a lot of our developmental surveillance Um, fine motor skills, language, uh, gross motor, if they run across the room to get the book from you, all of that. And you notice we haven't said anything yet, right? We're just observing what happens. It's only then that you get to ask the question in a a neutral, non-judgmental question. Tell me, how often do you get a chance to share books together, right? Because there's no one right answer. If you say, oh, um, you read to your child every night, right? Well, then what happened? Then what happens is that you get something along the lines of, oh, uh, yes, of course I do. So asking a neutral question then gives the parent a chance to, to offer an answer, and then you can take it from there. Take whatever they're doing or what they'd like to do, and then you can build off of that and kind of grow that and also do some troubleshooting. You know, the parent who tells me that their squirmy toddler no longer likes being read to, what they're doing is often they're, they're, they're reading at their child instead of with their child because they think their child is supposed to sit quietly and just listen to the story. Well, that doesn't work for a 15-month-old. They have a naturally short attention span. That's a normal thing. 
So parents get easily discouraged if they don't recognize that's normal. And if we tell them, you know, it's actually absolutely okay if, you're, if your child doesn't want to read every single page. It's okay if you go backwards in the book. It's okay if you talk about the pictures. You know, we're not going to make you write an essay on the book. So by doing that sort of thing, we help them be successful at reading with their child at a very short attention span, squirmy stage, and maintain that um, through their childhood. Like you, we've experienced that it's not uncommon for parents of toddlers to think that they're doing something wrong if their toddlers don't want to sit through a whole story from beginning to end. But it's very much about the experience of holding the child on your lap and turning the pages and talking together. Right. The technical term for this, um, for your listeners who might want to know, is called dialogic reading. You're having a dialogue over the book. It's not a one-way, you sit here and listen to me read, right? So if you think about um, where the wild things are, right? Um, you don't have to read the text. You could say to your child, can you help me find Max in this picture? Where's Max? Oh, there he is. What is he in? Oh, he's in a boat. What color is that boat? Oh, yes, you're right. It's a red boat, right? That back and forth, it doesn't matter with that young child if you don't ever get to reading the story out loud. When they're three or four, they'll be more likely to sit there and listen. And that's, that's and it'll be fine. Those are excellent tips for parents of toddlers. Let's talk about reading to babies. As I think you know, we here at Highlights have developed a magazine for babies, Highlights Hello, and we also publish a lot of books for babies. I've sometimes talked to parents who are unsure about how reading to a baby uh, actually works. They're just unsure how to go about it exactly. Reading aloud to babies is so important to healthy brain development, and it's so helpful with parent-child bonding. It sets the stage for a future love of reading. Mm -hmm. It definitely does. And, and, you know, even just hearing your voice and as the baby gets just a little bit older, even those nonverbal things that they can do, um, pointing or smiling or responding. And when you respond, whether it's verbally or your facial expression or anything like that, 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 that shows the child, oh, there's a response that I can make happen right, in someone who cares for me and loves me and kind of turns into that back and forth that's there. You know, it's, you, you bring up a very interesting point that, um, that I think is, is really uh, key to high, uh, highlight here. The, the, there's so many things that we give to parents in terms of advice. You know, we have billboards and ads and brochures saying, talk, read, sing, play with your child. Well, that's great. And parents hear this and they get it and they want to do it, but they're not so sure how to do it. We, we, many of us learned how to do this because others in our environment did it. But what if you don't have good models around you? Well, how do you know you're doing it right? What are you supposed to say to a six month old, right? All of those sorts of things. So when we provide a little bit of coaching, some encouragement, we're basically setting it up for parents to, to be successful and confident in that role. So it's not just giving out information, which is where a lot of programs stop. It's saying, how do we provide a scaffold and a structure? And what I like about, for example, some of the, the highlights uh, publications for, for babies, it's not just this is for the baby, it's also for the parent, right? To give them that kind of scaffold and help them kind of figure out, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. And then as they gain that confidence, they can, they can move to, to whatever they'd like. You know, so often parents have the right instincts. They know what to do. It's just a little bit of an issue of confidence. Um, I think it's really hard to read to babies wrong, isn't it? I, th I think that is the case. I, I would say so often it is confidence, but often it's really feeling like they're not really sure what it what the next step is, right? Um, because if, especially if a parent themselves um, may not have done so well in terms of their own education, um, you know, they might not they might have struggled through school. They may worry. They may worry that they're going to teach their child the wrong things. Um, so if if just to have someone there saying. Yes. Oh, I really like how you did that. You know, you might try this and see what he does in that case, right? That sort of coaching. Yeah, it takes a little more work, but it's so, more, so much more effective, so much more effective than just simply throwing things 
uh, brochures and saying, well, just read to your child. Um, I, 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 often the example I give is uh, medical students. We don't have medical students start on day one and say, well, okay, go, go take that patient's appendix out. <laughs> and then act like, what do you mean you don't know how to do that? Doesn't everyone know how to do that? Right? Why is parenting any different? Parenting is hard. You know, so we need to kind of stop that this this assumption that it's it's almost like people act like it's a moral failing like this. You must not love your child enough if you don't read, don't know how to read to them. Well, then let's simply do a little coaching and they'll be fine. That's so important. What advice do you have for parents in terms of selecting what they would read to a toddler or to a baby? I know most parents are familiar with board books. Board books and other other picture books. Um, board books are great if you want the child to manipulate the pages. You know, those we often think board books are really about tough books that children can mouth and throw and the book can withstand it. But the other thing is the thickness of those pages is actually designed for a kid who doesn't yet have a pincer grasp. They, if they have a palmer grasp, they bat at those pages to get them to turn. And so a board book is actually beautifully engineered to allow for that. But whatever it seems to appeal to your child, and, you know, honestly, squirmy toddler, keep a nice stack of books and move on through them. I'm actually not too concerned if a child spends like a whole 20 seconds on a book and moves on. You know, that's okay. Um, they might also want to study a book for many minutes, and that's also okay. So I think having a broad variety, um, and certainly if access to books or affording books is, is, a, is a problem, um, you can check out many lovely books through Bookmobile, Public Library, et cetera, programs. Um, and just let them have that variety and go through it uh, to whatever extent they want. There are, of course, beautiful award-winning books. They're award-winning for a reason. Um, there's lists online that are produced by many entities. And your local public librarian is usually great at offering advice. But I'm going to say it might matter more for a preschooler, certainly older kids. Toddlers tend not to be too picky, or at least they're not picky in predictable ways. So, I had a, a child care provider when my children were young. And the husband used to pull my son up on his lap when he was about three, two or three, and go through car magazines with him together. At that age, even that kind of reading together is wonderful, right? Yeah, you know, at a young age in particular, it's about hearing your voice. Um, we had a dad once in the newborn intensive care unit uh, who would read the articles from the Wall Street Journal out loud to his, his preterm baby. You know, it's about voice more than, than anything else. Now, I can't imagine a 15-month-old being too excited by looking at a newspaper filled with mostly text. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's really about having that shared experience together. Um, and, you know, you can turn looking at an, a car magazine that's geared for adults into, into a great game, right? Hey, let's count the wheels. What color are these cars? You know, um, et cetera, et cetera. And it's the feeling of closeness. And as you say, hearing the familiar voice and it's strengthening the parent-child bond. Mm -hmm. And that it, it gives us an activity to do together. And the thing is, even small doses of those, those that physical contact and, and time shared together looking at something um, can be very effective, right? No one's saying you should be reading to your child for four hours a day straight. You know, that, that probably won't go so well. You know, but even if you're a busy family and you say, okay, I have 10 minutes, you know, let's sit down for 10 minutes. That 10 minutes actually has much more of an effect than you'd think. That's an important point. I think most of us know the importance of bedtime stories, and that's a ritual that's very common in many households, but it doesn't have to be just at bedtime. It can be any time. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And and thinking about are there times in your life with a young child where, you know, you have a moment, right? You're you're waiting in line somewhere or you're at an appointment and you're in the waiting room. Choosing to pull out a book um, can is, is a great option to kind of make good use of those short segments of time. Um, and certainly better than continually putting a child in front of a screen. Um, you know, we can certainly talk a lot about screen media, 
But I think that um, allowing children to kind of see the reading together or reading on their own even, if they just want to quietly look at the book themselves, uh, as a default activity rather than, oh, we're not doing anything for these five seconds. I must ask for the phone, you know, which is which is becoming all too common. Uh, it's about expectations and what kids really are are looking for. Yeah, it's easy to slip a book, a board book, or a small book into a diaper bag or a purse or a tote bag, uh, mm-hmm. but it, and make good use of those little periods of time we have together. I will also say that asking places that you might be in frequently, like a doctor's office or anything along those lines. You know, if they fill their waiting room with screens and other digital distractions, you might make a comment and say, you know, I'd love to see more books out here. I'd love to see more, um, you know, toys that are physical toys for them to play with, et cetera, um, because they, they often take that into account. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's amazing kind of in, this, in the name of, oh, we need to have something for the children and people who aren't actually experts in child development and thinking about this are sometimes developing those spaces. Um, I've actually seen better waiting rooms at uh, um, car service centers sometimes than in some doctor's offices, you know, in terms of what's good for children. Interesting. That's a great suggestion. Can you talk about the importance of repetition? Toddlers and preschoolers often want to hear the same stories over and over. Parents may tire of that, but it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. And, and, I, and I just want to highlight that it's a perfectly normal thing. I have run into families more than once who very hesitantly asked me if their kid is okay. Like, is their brain okay or something like that? And, you know, I've said, um, they, I don't have any reason to think it's not. Why do you ask? And they say, well, I w- they want to hear the same story over and over. And to them, they were really worried. They were saying, does, this, does my child have a memory problem? you know, or something, and didn't recognize that this is actually um, a, a normal developmental um, process. So I think we should, you know, it's not just, gee, is repetition, you know, okay. It's also it's like, no, no, it's really not a sign of anything bad. So repetition offers a few things to children. It offers familiarity, right? If you know what's going to happen next, you know, in a book that you've read many times, it offers a sense of mastery, of control in a world that's often confusing and new and, and, and all those things. So for a child to know, oh, I know what comes next, actually gives them a sense of control when they themselves can't decode text yet, you know, and so on. It also offers a sense of comfort and familiarity. And sometimes it can offer when it's done just enough times, just like anything, it can offer a way to, to convey um, um, a sentiment or an emotion that they might not be able to put together yet. So I'll give you an example. Um, when my son was young, I used to read Goodnight Moon to him uh, as the last book we would read before we would turn out the lights and you know put him in bed and turn out the lights. That's a classic. Yes. And there was one night he must have just been tired. You know, and he, he, he was maybe a year old. He wasn't saying much yet. He must have been feeling tired. He reached down in the stack of books that I had, grabbed Goodnight Moon, and handed it to me. And I was like, oh, okay. He's telling me, I'm tired. I want to go to bed, right? So we quickly read it and off to bed, right? And it was great because he knew what that was a signal for. He knew what it meant. And he was able to convey his his uh, his desire to me um, in a very clear way. I love that story. That's great. Our conversation today reminds me of that saying, readers are made on the laps of their parents. But I'm thinking that we could also say readers are made in the arms of their parents because it's really never too soon to begin exposing children to books. We know the evidence is fairly clear that that reading to children and exposing them to books and and the book sharing, more importantly, um, from birth is is key and critical. So Richard and Reed has been been saying that now for um, uh, from the from birth piece, certainly for the last several years, uh, and certainly from infancy for 30 years. Uh, the program is 30 years old this year, um, this past year. And, uh, so, so we, we, we know how important that is. And it, it is, you know, I think sometimes there are parents who say, why would my child get anything out of a book now? Um, and we know that the brain science has really showed us that it does uh, all the things that we've we've talked about. 
And there's no reason to wait until a child is older because they get that familiarity and that comfort uh, with, with books. You know, there's a lot of conversations in our society these days about um, children and reading ability and what's the best way to teach reading. So there's things that can get in the way of reading, right? There's the various learning disabilities. Um, there's some kids who don't mesh well with certain instructional techniques. And there's this whole controversy about, you know, what's the best way to, to teach reading and so on. But for me, there's, also, there's all those things which are important issues. But then I worry about the child who, because they didn't have early exposure to books, is starting off behind when they enter kindergarten. And it's not an issue of instruction style. It's not an issue of a learning disability. It's an issue of having almost no exposure to, to text um, and, and, book share, and shared book reading. So I think it's really critical that we kind of take that out of play. Right. And then make sure that we're addressing all the other things later on. I hear you saying that reading to children early and getting them comfortable with books really early makes kindergarten readiness much easier to achieve. Yeah. I'll, let me give you a quick example. Um, there's a big difference between me walking in with a five year old, walking into the exam room of a five year old with a book in my hand. And they say, oh, if you give a mouse a cookie, oh, I love that book. And they jump down off the exam table, run over to me, grab the book from my hands and start turning pages. Okay, first of all, I've seen gross motor skills because they jumped off and ran over. Uh, fine motor skills because they're flipping pages. Um, language, they know what a book is. They recognize this book. They're being read to, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, I have, and then if I hold that book out to them and I say, can you... How many letters do you know on the, on the title on the front page? And they're often able to pick out a good five, six, seven. Okay, great. This child is pretty ready for kindergarten, right? I don't need to do a whole lot more in terms of chasing that down. And I've gotten a chance to observe it directly and not only rely on, on what the parent thinks and so on. Contrast that to, true story, um, a four-year-old. They weren't actually even my patient. Their brother, little brother was in for a a checkup. I'd never met this family before. And I gave the four-year-old um, a gently used book just to look at while we were busy with the, the, the little brother. And he sat there um, for the entire visit with the book upside down, backwards, and closed. And he didn't have the intellectual curiosity to open the book or to look at it or flip through it or anything like that. And I'm, I'm looking at him out of the corner of my eye and going, wow, he's just really not exploring or engaging that book. You know, so we talked about it a little bit at the end of the visit. And mom's response was very interesting. She looked at him and she said, see, even the doctor's telling you, you should be looking at books. But here's the thing. She didn't know how important she was as a part of that, right? She was kind of saying, here's a book here, go read, you know, not recognizing that that's going to happen when he's with her next to her in her lap and they're looking at the book together, you know? And so she needed a little coaching, a little advice, a little encouragement, which I did, you know, to kind of recognize that it's not just here, here's a book, go look at it, that he needs that engagement, that back and forth. But that child, I looked at him and said, wow, in the back of my head, I'm going, if we don't do something here, he's gonna start kindergarten really behind. And I could see that out of the corner of my eye because he had the book there. See, this is the thing. In a checkup where there's no other significant issue or concern that's that's being identified at the outset, I would I learn more from that book and watching the child and the family with it than I do from my stethoscope. It's fascinating, fascinating approach. What does the research say about reading to uh, reading to babies in utero? Ah, uh, yeah, that's that's a tough one. There's not the research is sort of all over the place. Um, and it's hard to kind of tease out reading versus simply hearing parental voices. So I'll, I'll start by saying we have great evidence that babies recognize the voices of their parents, um, mother more so than father, just because of proximity um, and so on. But even with fathers, babies will, newborn babies will often, if, if, if uh, they hear a stranger's voice on one side and the parent's voice on the other, they'll often turn towards that familiar voice because it's familiar. Um, how much language development occurs before birth? We don't really know that there's a whole lot there. 
Now, and you can't really design an experiment. You can't tell someone, do not say any word ever around your child. <laughs> um, and of course, the child, uh, around your, your child during pregnancy, and of course, you, you can't show a book to your child in utero or anything like that. So pulling apart voice from re, you know reading voice versus talking voice, yeah, I don't have strong evidence to say that it makes a huge difference. At the same time, it's not harmful. So if you want to read to your child and build that emotional bond and connection, at least on your side from that, sure. Um, if someone told me, no, I'm not going to read to my child, child in utero, it seems silly. I'd be, I'd say, sure, that's also okay. I don't think it's a problem. Well, it's good practice for what's to come, right? <laughs> Certainly. Yeah, yeah. And it w- may remind parents um, about how wonderful children's literature is, how beautiful the stories are, and, and they'll begin to fall in love all over again with kids lit, um, which will serve their kids well when they're born. So. Well, and if they're busy and they need an excuse to spend some time looking at children's books, um, they can use that as an excuse. <laughs> there you go. Uh, is there anything, Dr. Nafsario, that we haven't talked about that you think would be important to um, say to parents of young children? I think that really so much of it comes down to it. You don't have to be too worried about picking exactly the right books or using exactly the right techniques to read um, or, or anything along those lines, right? It's that engagement. It's letting the child lead. If they want to flip through five books that quickly, that is absolutely fine when they're young. Um, there's no such thing as the absolute right book or the absolute best way to do it. We have zero evidence of that. So, um, because I get a lot of questions sometimes, like I need to know exactly what the best books are. It's like, well, I can't predict that for any individual child um, that's out there. So just relax, read aloud, listen to your child's cues. There's gonna be some days that they're not so into reading. There's some, some days that they're feeling tired. Um, you know, some days that they just want to do something else and that's okay, but also don't let reading slip away completely, you know, in favor of something else. There's a lot of distractions out there. Um, digital things as well, you know, TV devices, etc., can pull your child's attention away so much that they start to want to do that instead of reading. So making sure that you're preserving reading, um, and just because your child eventually becomes a good reader doesn't mean you can't read aloud, out loud to them. I read with my children every night that I was not working or on call um, all the way until really the end of middle school. Uh, they were, they're good readers. They didn't need me to read out loud to them, but it was something we did that really connected. And the only reason we stopped was um, high school, just <laughs> sports and other things uh, just got in the way a little bit too much in the evenings. Yeah, there have been a lot of surveys of children who like to read, and one of the things that pops up often is the idea that even though they've learned to read independently, they still love it when a teacher or a parent reads aloud to them. And maybe that's why audiobooks are so uh, popular with adults, too. Maybe we all love to be read aloud, too. You know, honestly, text processing, the, the process of the eyes taking in written text decoding it into this thing we call language and gaining understanding from it actually takes a lot of work, right? There's a lot of brain power in that. It's not so hard to do that sort of processing when, you, when you're hearing things. Um, so sometimes, you know, just uh, kids like to just hear out loud. And, and that's the other thing. Audiobooks are not cheating, you know? Sometimes to let a kid enjoy language, narrative, vocabulary, all these wonderful things and not have to do that hard work of text decoding um, is, is perfectly fine. That's a really good point because I think their listening level is higher than their reading level often. So it's an opportunity to introduce them to some books and stories that maybe they wouldn't be exposed to just yet because they aren't able to read them, but they're able to understand them. Mm-hmm. Certainly. Anything else you think we should cover that we haven't? No, I think that's the main thing. It's, it's not super difficult, but man, the brain science, the evidence is absolutely overwhelming as to how good reading is for children. Um, you know, so I, I think no, no one should feel any hesitation about doing it. And if they find that they're not so sure, there's a lot of great resources um, uh, online, libraries, etc. 
um, going to story time at the libraries and watching how the, like, the children's librarians engage kids. You can pick up a lot of tips there. Um, and hopefully you're bringing your child to a healthcare practice that has Reach Out and Read and you're getting that extra support there as well. Those are all great tips. We loved it in, was it 2014 when the uh, Academy of Pediatrics came out with a recommendation officially that parents should read to their children? Yeah, the early literacy promotion statement. And I will tell you that the revision to that is being worked on. So uh, hopefully in the next 18 months or so, maybe something will appear there. Um, uh, I I think we can all safely assume we will still be encouraging reading, um, but I think uh, probably there'll be some uh, more nuanced advice as well as kind of taking advantage of uh, some of the research that's come since to, to really uh, see if we can offer even better um, approaches for families. Oh, that's so interesting. We'll have to talk to you again after that's released. Sounds good. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for your time and thank you for your uh, commitment to nurturing and children a love of reading. Oh, you're very welcome. And thank you for everything you do through Highlights to really provide these routes for families to uh, be able to engage their children really across such a broad age spectrum. It's really important work. Thank you. Thanks. For show notes and information about other episodes in our podcast series, visit us at loveofreading.highlights.com. My name is Kinley. I read aloud to my little sister who's four years old. We'll sit in her bedroom and we'll just read.